Hello, I'm meteorologist Joe Winters, and on behalf of the entire First Alert Storm team, I'd like to welcome you to the KCRG TV9 Severe Weather Special for Kids. During the next half hour, you will learn a little bit about how the weather works and what happens when it gets bad. We will talk about flooding, heat, lightning, thunderstorms, and tornadoes. Please enjoy, and thank you very much for watching. Do you see that? Yep, that's a tornado. It's a spinning column of air that's touching the ground. Now, tornadoes vary in size and shape, and they do damage. In fact, sometimes lots of damage. But how do tornadoes form? For that, let's ask meteorologist Kai O'Mara. You know, whenever we see a tornado in nature, there's always something in common. It's always spinning around. And guess what? In your own home, you can make a tornado in a bottle. All you need is two two-liter bottles. They should be clear plastic like these. A little fixture like this, which you can get at the toy department at your favorite department store. A little bit of food coloring for the water that you'll put in one bottle. And a little bit of glitter as well so that you can see the tornado. What you do then is you put this fixture on top of one bottle with the water in it. Then, with this other bottle, you put this right on the top. This is where your tornado will actually go towards when you turn the bottles over. So we get these nice and tight, just like this. And then what we're going to do is we'll turn it over very quickly and then start to spin the bottle around just like a tornado. So here we go. We'll turn it over and then spin it around just like a tornado. And before too long, look at this. Our tornado forms right here in the bottle. The glitter is going around simulating the rotation in the atmosphere and this tornado will continue to go through this bottle all the way until it gets towards the bottom and that is a tornado in a bottle. This is video of the Iowa State University tornado simulator. This large simulator allows scientists to further study tornadoes and how they form. Similar to the tornado you see here, the scientists can form tornadoes in this simulator and test the winds on small houses and neighborhoods, like this. This research can help keep us safe in the future by finding out where the strongest winds are in a tornado and just how fast a tornado may form. The more we know about tornadoes, the safer we will be. Let's talk about how a tornado forms. Notice the wind directions here. The warm air near the ground, shown in red, is coming from the south. Cool air higher up, shown in blue, is coming from the west or the northwest. This allows the air to begin to roll and rotate. When the thunderstorms begin to form, they take the warm air from the surface and lift it into the thunderstorm. This then tilts that rotation a little more vertical. Then it becomes likely to have a rotating thunderstorm. Having a rotating thunderstorm is a sign that there could be the potential to develop a tornado. Let's look now inside the storm. Notice the red arrows on the screen. This is the warm air being drawn into the storm. As the warm air is drawn upwards, it begins to cool. The cool air begins to sink back down the backside of the thunderstorm. The rotation then begins to strengthen as the storm becomes more and more intense. This then forms a vortex in the thunderstorm. A vortex is a rotating column of air within a thunderstorm. A wall cloud is the next step in making a tornado. This wall cloud looks just like its name, a wall. From there, a funnel cloud may form. Funnel then reaches the ground, and when that happens, there is now officially a tornado on the ground. Tornadoes can last for a few seconds or a few hours, depending on the strength of the storm. They can go back up into the cloud without warning. They can drop back down from the cloud without warning. Once tornadoes are on the ground, they can move swiftly. So be sure and take shelter when a tornado warning is issued for your area. Thanks, Kai. It's here in the United States that most tornadoes occur in the entire world. And it's the central part of the United States that's known as Tornado Alley. It stretches from Iowa back across the Plain States down through Texas. This is an area where the warm, moist air coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico will interact with cold, dry air coming south from Canada to produce thunderstorms, which can ultimately spawn tornadoes. Most tornadoes happen in Texas. Over 100 tornadoes usually happen there every year. Iowa gets about 50 tornadoes each year, not nearly as many as Texas. Not all tornadoes are exactly the same size. Some are large at over a half mile in size. Some are small and can be less than 100 yards wide. Big 
Big tornadoes usually have very strong winds. The small tornadoes tend to be weaker, but sometimes they can be just as or stronger than the big tornadoes. Now to demonstrate, think of a figure skater when they spin around in a circle. Have you ever noticed what happens when they bring their arms in? They get faster, don't they? Well, small tornadoes can sometimes get wound up like figure skaters and have very strong wind, sometimes stronger than big tornadoes. So just remember that any tornado, big or small, can do a lot of damage. Everybody has a name, right? Well, tornadoes need names too. And while people have a big list to choose from, tornadoes have only six choices. They are EF0, EF1, EF2, EF3, EF4, and EF5. Not very exciting, right? Now what happens is after a tornado occurs, meteorologists go to where the tornado caused damage. From looking at the damage, they can figure out about how fast the winds were around the tornado. Once they do, they assign it a name from the Enhanced Fujita Scale. That's where the EF comes from in the name. EF zeros are the weakest tornadoes with winds between 65 and 85 miles per hour. EF5 tornadoes are the strong ones with winds over 200 miles per hour. Fujita is the last name of a scientist that came up with the scale back in the 1970s. In Iowa, tornadoes occur most commonly during the months of April, May, and June. Now they can happen in other months, but those three months are the most common. And certainly tornadoes can be scary. But do you know that your chances of being hit by a tornado are very, very small? In fact, based on the size of Iowa and things like how many tornadoes hit the state of Iowa, your chance of being hit by a tornado is 1 in 300,000. So not very good. You know, thunderstorms are a lot like popping popcorn. Heat in this pan is able to make the kernels expand and eventually pop. Well, heat in the sky can force clouds to expand and essentially pop into thunderstorms. Well, to better understand how thunderstorms form, you must first understand the water cycle. First Alert Storm Team meteorologist Lance Ryan explains. The water cycle is an essential part of weather. Let me explain. Now, the water cycle begins as the sun heats the earth. This causes evaporation, so water turns from a liquid to a gas. It rises up and eventually forms clouds. Now these clouds will organize and the winds will push these clouds over land and eventually the clouds will grow large enough that the clouds begin to rain. The rain falls back to earth, then eventually all that water runs into lakes and rivers and heads back toward the ocean and this water cycle process starts all over again. So in a nutshell, without the water cycle, thunderstorms cannot form. Storm clouds tend to be quite large. Sometimes their tops can reach over 50,000 feet in the sky. Typically, the taller the storm is, the stronger it is. Hot days are good for making big storms because hot air can rise very quickly. This is the main reason Iowa hardly has any storms in the winter. It's usually too cold for making thunderstorms. Thunderstorms usually contain four parts. They are lightning, hail, wind, and heavy rain. Each of these can cause damage. For example, lightning can strike trees like this one here. Trees can also be knocked over by thunderstorm winds, which can make the power go out. Heavy rain can cause flash flooding that may cover roads, making it impossible for cars to pass through it. Hail can do a number on a car left outside. Check this out. Hail comes in many different sizes. Some is the size of a pea, while some is the size of a softball. The size of the hail usually depends on how long it stays in a thunderstorm. So we're here at the science station, and Becky Ortner is going to use a leaf blower and a plastic ball to demonstrate what happens to hail inside a thunderstorm. Now, in order for hail to form, we need very strong winds moving upward in a thunderstorm. Now, when the winds are strong in a thunderstorm, the hail is carried upward, but eventually the hail grows enough that it becomes too heavy and we're going to demonstrate this using a basketball. Notice how the hailstone has a hard time being suspended above the leaf blower, this basketball, and eventually the hailstone will grow large enough that it will fall out of the thunderstorm and hit the ground. 
One of the biggest hailstones known to fall from the sky was 17.5 inches in circumference, and it weighed over one and a half pounds. It happened in Coffeyville, Kansas, back on September 3, 1970. Well, thanks, Lance. Thunder can be very scary sounding. Well, just know that thunder is a sound, and it cannot hurt you. I'm going to do a demonstration. I'm going to put my hands out in front of me like this. When lightning happens, it splits the air apart because it's so hot. And then the air slams back together. So we have lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder. Try it with me. Put your hands out in front of you like this. All right, here we go. Lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder, lightning, thunder. OK, OK, OK. Stop, stop, stop. Very nice job. Thunder should alert you that a thunderstorm is near and that you should seek shelter and stay away from windows. Do you know that you can tell how far away lightning is without actually having to measure it? It's easy. When you see lightning in the distance, begin counting the seconds until you hear thunder. Count like this, 1 1,000, 2 1,000, and so on. However many seconds it takes to hear thunder, divide that number by 5 and that is how many miles away lightning is. Let's do an example. In the distance, you see lightning. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000, 4 1,000, 5 1,000, then you hear thunder. So that's 5 seconds. Divide that by 5, you get 1. That's how far away lightning is, 1 mile. According to the National Weather Service, at any one moment, about 1,800 thunderstorms are happening at once in the world. That comes out to about 16 million per year. Of that 16 million, the United States sees about 100,000 thunderstorms per year. In Iowa, thunderstorms usually happen between the months of April and September. Wow, that's a lot of thunderstorms, 16 million in the world every year. Well, maybe the next time you're chopping on some good buttery popcorn or playing a game of basketball, you'll understand how thunderstorms form and what they can do. Right now, Julie from the Science Station is adding electrical charge to her body. Check out her awesome hair. This is called a Van de Graaff generator here at the Science Station. Electrical charge is able to travel back and forth between her body and this metal. Interaction like this happens all the time when it comes to thunderstorms. We see it as lightning. Lightning is the result of the buildup and discharge of electrical energy between positive and negative charges. Imagine positive charges as plus signs and negative charges as minus signs. At the base of a thunderstorm cloud, there is a substantial amount of negative charge or minus signs. On the ground, a lot of positive charge can build up or plus signs. Once charge is built up, lightning happens because positive and negative charges attract. You've probably heard that trees have a tendency to get struck by lightning more than the ground. Well, that's because trees can have a lot of positive charge, more than the nearby ground, so lightning has a better chance of striking a tree. Did you know that lightning does not always go from cloud to ground? Sometimes it can go from ground to cloud. Other times it can go from cloud to cloud. It can also go from cloud to air. Wherever it happens, the difference in electrical charge is what causes lightning. Lightning is hot. The temperature of lightning is about 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature on the surface of the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So lightning is five times the temperature on the surface of the sun. It's hot enough when it's 100 degrees outside. Can you imagine 50,000 degrees? According to the National Weather Service, lightning strikes in the United States about 20 million times each year. In the entire world, about 100 lightning strikes happen every second. That comes out to about 8 million strikes per day. Many of those lightning strikes happen in Africa. Lightning is truly an amazing part of weather. It can light up the night sky, making it so you can see for miles. But despite how amazing lightning can be, it is dangerous. So if you're ever outside and you see lightning, you need to get inside. Thanks a lot, Julie. I think you may need that. You see this football field? It's dry now, but a few years ago, it was flooded due to heavy rainfall. Back in 2004, heavy rain from thunderstorms caused Squaw Creek and Marion to overflow, and that spilled onto Linmar football field. 
Some students got stuck on the bleachers and had to be rescued. Luckily for them, rescue workers got them out quickly. Floodwaters oftentimes cover up roadways. This can be dangerous to people that want to get through it, and it's dangerous for a few reasons. One reason is that floodwaters over a road can actually wash away the road with time. The water can make soil fall apart around and under the road. Another reason flood water over a road is dangerous is sometimes there can be a strong current in the water that can actually move a large object like an automobile. One thing you should never do is drink or play in flood waters. The flood water likely contains some nasty germs that you don't want in or on your body. There's a chance that flood water traveled through a nearby field that may contain pesticides that can be dangerous. When it comes to flood waters, don't take a chance and risk getting hurt. Remember this simple saying, turn around, don't drown. You know, in Iowa, it can get really hot in the summer. Sometimes the temperature can go over 100 degrees, and that makes it feel very miserable to be outside. That's when you have to do your best to stay cool so your body does not get overheated. Try drinking some water. That's very good. The months of June, July, and August are usually the hottest in Iowa. During these months, high temperatures during the day are usually in the 80s. As you probably know, the weather is not the same every day. Some days it can be very hot. Take July 5, 1911, for example, way back before many of your grandparents were born. On that day, it got to 110 degrees in eastern Iowa. In the summertime, not only can it be hot outside, but it can also be hot inside vehicles like these with doors shut and windows rolled up. In fact, outside right now, it's about 84 degrees. Let's find out how warm it is inside this truck. Oh boy, it's warm in here. Look at the thermometer now. 113 degrees inside this truck. That's over 29 degrees warmer than it is out there outside. In fact, heat gets trapped in here and makes it unbearable at times and very, very dangerous. In fact, I'm getting out of here. What happens when your body gets exposed to too much heat like this? For the answer, let's contact a doctor. First of all, I want you to know that our bodies function to keep the body temperature normal so that all the organ systems can function perfectly well. If the body is exposed to too much heat, it can overheat and all the organ systems won't function well. So when the body temperature rises and gets too high, it sends a signal to the brain. Emergency, emergency, the body's getting overheated, do something. The brain then starts to send messages to the rest of the organ systems to tell them, do something right now. The skin the, uh, starts to sweat because the vessels will dilate in order to bring that temperature down. But if it doesn't work, for instance, if you don't have enough fluids there, things can start to cascade down and all of the organ systems will start to fail. You'll start to get a headache. You'll start to feel weak. You'll start to feel like you want to throw up. And then things can get much worse if you don't do something right away. In addition to avoiding too much time in the heat, you want to avoid too much time in the sun. The sun's rays can damage your skin if you are not careful. If at all possible, it is best to not get sunburned to avoid skin problems when you are older. If you are outside in the sun, be sure to wear sunblock. In fact, the more the better. Remember, not all sunblock is waterproof. Do you know what to wear outside when it's hot so your body doesn't overheat? Let's play Are the Clothes Right? Today, we're looking for the best dressed for heat. The object of the game is to get the most approval from our panel of judges. Say hello. Let's meet our first contestant, Joe. Joe, come on out. As you can see, Joe is wearing a winter coat. He has a stocking cap on, a pair of gloves, some snow pants, some thick socks, and a pair of snow boots. What do we think, judges? Are the clothes right? No! Oh, why not? 
could get way too hot with all those winter clothes on. Sorry, Joe. Your clothes were not right. Better luck next time. Let's bring out our next contestant, Lance. Lance, come on out. Take a look. He's got a towel around his neck. He's got a tank top and a pair of swim trunks. Now, judges, what do we think of Lance? We have a question. Is Lance wearing sunscreen? So, Lance, are you wearing sunscreen? No. What do we think, judges? No! Let's bring in our last contestant, Josh. Josh, come on out. Josh is wearing a light-colored t-shirt. Hey, there's some water right there. Some shorts, some sandals. He's putting sunscreen on his arms. He's wearing a hat. He has sunglasses. Judges, what do we think? Yeah! yeah! Why do we think Josh should win? Because he's drinking water and protecting his skin. Congratulations, Josh. You've won the game. Here's a congratulatory medal that you can put around your hat. And thanks for joining us on Are the Clothes Right? And the weather outside stays sunny as we head through the evening hours. Should be a nice, quiet night. Take a look at the seven-day forecast, and you can see all the way through the weekend, it looks like our weather is going to cooperate and stay very... Pinpoint. Hi, Joe. Do you know that I'm live on the air right now? You are? Yeah, say hi to all your fans. Hi, everybody. Pinpoint's one of our friends in the weather department that stops by once in a while. Um, I suppose we can take a minute. Pinpoint, did you have something you needed to know? Yes, Joe. I have lots of questions for you. Ooh, well, what kind of questions? About school? No. About home? No. Mm, let me guess. About the weather? That's it. Oh. What questions do you have, Pinpoint? What should I do if I see lightning or hear thunder and I'm outside playing. If you see lightning or you hear thunder, you should get inside very fast. Like this? That's very good, Pinpoint. Pinpoint, you can come back now. We have no lightning or thunder right now, but you did exactly what I said. Get inside very fast. Take 30 seconds or less and get inside a building. And then you wait. And you wait, Pinpoint, until that storm is done. And once that storm is done and you don't see any more lightning, you don't hear any more thunder, you wait another 30 minutes before you go outside. We call that the 30-30 rule to stay safe during thunderstorms. The 30-30 rule. That sounds good. So it's very easy to do. Just remember to get inside fast and stay inside until that storm is passed. So Pinpoint, do you have any other weather questions for me? Mm-hmm. Can I take a bath if it's storming outside? Well, Pinpoint, if it's storming outside, like with lightning and thunder, you don't want to be taking a bath or a shower. Do you know why? Why? Because lightning is made of electricity, and that electricity can travel through the water very easily or through some of the piping that's in your bathroom. So you don't want to be near it when it's lightning and thundering outside. That'll keep you safe. Now, did you have other things that you wondered about? Can can I talk on the phone if there's a thunderstorm? Well, you don't really want to be on the phone either. It's kind of the same reason that we said with the shower and the bath. A phone that's connected with a line can have electricity travel along that line. And if you're holding onto the phone, guess what? That electricity could hit you, and you don't want that to happen. So no, you do not want to be on a phone during a thunderstorm. Well, Pinpoint, you've been asking a lot of questions about thunderstorms and lightning. Uh, is there anything else you need to know about? Well, I'm really scared of tornadoes. What should I do if there's a tornado? Well, you need to get to a safe place. So you need to know what that safe place is. And every building that you're in or if you're outside, it can be different. But there's a couple of things you need to keep in mind. So if you know that there's a tornado around, Maybe you've heard that there's a warning, or you've heard the siren go off, or mom says, hey, we need to get to our safe place. Get to the lowest level that you can get to in whatever building you're in. Now at home, that might be your basement. Um, at school, maybe there's a basement that you can get to. Maybe you can't get to a basement. Then you can get to a hallway 
what you want to do then is put as many walls between yourself and the storm as possible and make sure you stay away from windows and doors. You don't want to be near the window looking at the storm or by doors because there's a lot of wind with these storms and that can cause some problems. So lowest level you can get to safely. Lowest away, level. Away from windows and doors. Away from windows and doors. And then you know what you want to do? What? You want to cover your head with blankets, pillows, or your hand just like that. Very good. We call it the turtle. Get in the turtle position and wait for that storm to pass. You're very good at that pinpoint. I like turtles. You've been practicing, haven't you? The TV9 Weather Lab is quiet right now, but sometimes it can get very busy. Severe weather is one of those times. From your 24-hour news and weather source, KCRG TV9, this is a severe weather alert. Good afternoon, I'm meteorologist Joe Winters, joined by Josh Baines, Kyle Mara, and Lance Ryan. We're following a line of thunderstorms that has been developing through the day, now producing some severe weather. And Josh, I understand we're talking about some tornadoes. Yeah, Blackhawk County. If there is a bad thunderstorm or tornado, we'll break into programming to let people know about it. We tell people watching where the weather is going to be bad. We use several tools in the TV9 Weather Lab to help us, including live pinpoint Doppler radar. With radar, we are able to see what about a storm is bad, like how big the hail is, or how fast the winds are. Sometimes you may hear us use the word watch or warning when it comes to bad weather. Now there is a difference, and that difference is important. A severe weather watch means that bad weather could happen, like a thunderstorm or tornado. It doesn't mean that it is happening, it means it might happen. Now when there's a watch out, we'll stay in the TV9 weather lab and do just that. Watch the weather in case a storm gets bad. When storms do get bad, a warning may be issued. Now a severe weather warning for a bad thunderstorm or tornado means that it is happening. Key County, that's going to expire here shortly, so the threat is very minimal. It's Aside from what we broadcast on KCRG TV 9 and our digital sub channel, Local 9.2, we do offer other ways of passing on severe weather information. KCRG.com offers information about severe weather, including watch and warning information, lightning tracker, and pinpoint Doppler radar. Also on KCRG.com, you can sign up for something called Personal Pinpoint Futurecast, which has detailed information about severe weather. This information can be emailed to a cell phone to keep you informed about bad weather wherever you are. When there is bad weather, you will often hear siren sound. This is to alert people outside to get inside and avoid bad weather. These sirens are not meant for people already inside. If you are inside, the hope is that you are told about bad weather through television, radio, or the internet. We hope you've enjoyed what you've seen and learned a little bit along the way, too. For the entire First Alert Storm team and everyone here at KCRG TV9, thanks for watching the KCRG TV9 Severe Weather Special for Kids.